wisdom is what all people want to be wise. But there's a big difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. The wisdom we want is not of the world. Because the wisdom of the world is actually foolishness. That they're on the broad path, the broad road. It goes to the broad gate. It leads to death. But wisdom finds Christ. Wisdom is the path through the narrow gate and the narrow way. And then we find wisdom in, in Christ and in Christ alone, whom Colossus describes as whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in. And it's found in Him. And so wisdom, we want to live a wise life, a wise life that honors the Lord. And so we find a and this morning, we're going to be looking at that patience, uh, I should say a patient person is a wise person. And that possessions and leadership is only fitting for the wise, for God's people. Look at Proverbs 19.10. Luxury is not fitting for a fool, much less for a slave to rule over princes. Now, this proverb makes an observation from an ideal, ideal situation in the world, that one where sin is not, um, where sin doesn't affect things as much. Because the right thing is for possessions and luxuries for the wise. Not that we're not preaching a health and wealth gospel, and I'll explain why. It's not fitting for a fool, and it's only fitting for a wise person. But here, throughout the book of Proverbs, and I should say one of the reasons is because the path of wisdom is best. That's one of the reasons why luxury is not fitting for a fool. It's because the path of wisdom is best. Proverbs 1, 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. It is God's ways that make you successful. And I should say, successful is not always financial. But God does bless as He sees fit. And even as He told the Israelites, that is, do not forget God who makes, who's the one that gives you the houses and possessions, who has made you rich. But it's not all believers are going to be rich and wealthy. But the reason why, another reason why that luxury and possessions are not fitting for fools is because wise people know how to handle it. They know how to handle finances and possessions according to God's way, the way that honors Him. The wise are the ones that are generous to the poor. But however, fools do not know how to handle their possessions and money in a way that, that honors the Lord. Oh yes, unsaved people can make lots of money. This is not what the verse is saying, that they cannot. But when they do have lots of money, they are going to not do well with it. At least spend it on what matters, what really matters. Because what do wealthy people who are unsaved usually do? Big homes, yachts, and there's nothing wrong with that, but they spend a lot of the money on themselves. And if, and if they do give the charity, it's broadcasted. Here with the, we give you this billboard of a check. But they don't ever put towards what really matters in eternity. And so they cannot handle in a way that honors the Lord. They cannot. They get their money, they get themselves in trouble with money. I mean, consider how people handle money when they win the lottery. What are they spending their money on? A lot of them, they waste their money. They're broke. They go bankrupt. It, it's a, you would think that people win millions and millions of dollars would not go bankrupt. But in a very short amount of time, the majority of them are financially ruined. It's, they're divorced end up getting divorced. They get their money spending on prostitutes and drugs and other stuff. 
I mean, the same thing goes with athletes and their big contracts. Some of the, there's some, some of them, not all of them, will get themselves the same way in trouble. Drugs and alcohol. They'll go bankrupt. And even those who do not go bankrupt are not giving to missions. They're not, they're not spending on what really matters for eternity. They're not advancing Christ's kingdom. And that's why it's not fitting to have wealth. Plus, a fool thinks his wealth makes him secure. A wise person does not see that their wealth makes them secure. Their security comes in God, in Christ. That God is their rock and their foundation. That God is their refuge. God is their stronghold in the day of trouble. While a fool thinks their wealth is their stronghold, their security, makes them secure. I mean, remember just from the previous chapter, 1811, a rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own imagination. Yeah, he thinks that he's secure in the day of trouble, but he's not. Wealth does not bring security like they think. It does. One, wealth can come and go. Things can go very quickly. A lot of billionaires have their wealth in stocks, and you can see how quickly that can change. Even right now, a lot of stocks and everything is, is worth less than what it was. And so their wealth can greatly increase or greatly dis- decrease based on the stocks. Fires can happen. Disasters can happen. And so it's, not, it's in their own imagination they think they're secure. They're like the person in Luke 12 in Jesus' parable. Starting in verse 16. And he told a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began to reason him to himself saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you've prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That is why it is not fitting for an unsaved person. That's who the fool is. An unsaved person to have these things because they don't use it for the further God's kingdom. They don't use it for God's glory. They think it's their security. They, it's not going to... Jesus said, what is the profit of man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? They will lose their soul in the end. And even Solomon had trouble with with wealth. When his heart went away from the Lord, he spent it all on all kinds of pleasures. And so the reality is that actually very few people can ever handle wealth Lots of wealth in, in a way that honors the Lord. But all believers, we have possessions that God has given us. He's given us money and we, whatever we have, not what we wish we have, but what we have now is what we use for God's glory and use it in a way that honors Him. And the reality is, is that we have stuff, we are far wealthier than the, than the people in ancient times. Even some of the wealthiest people, yeah, they may have more money than we ever did, but we have a lot of other stuff at our disposal. I mean, they did not have nearly the amount of clothes we do, for example. They usually would only have a, a, a poor person would usually only have maybe one, if they one change of clothing, maybe a couple. A wealthy person might they they're not going to have they're not going to have 50 pairs of clothing like we do, but they would have a few more than a, a poor person. But we have things that they can ever dream of. And food, and I know that we're going through a rough time with food, but we can still find lots of food. And so we ought to use things for God's glory. 
And so luxury for a fool is not fitting. It's a strange thing that ought not to be. And then he says in Proverbs 19.10, much less for a slave the rule over princes. And this verse is similar. There's another verse in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes 10, 5 through 7, where he speaks of a strange thing. There's an evil I have seen under the sun, like an error which goes forth from the ruler. Folly is set in many exalted places, while rich men sit in humble places. I have seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the land. See, this verse, these, this verse Proverbs 19.10 compares two things that ought not to be. That's not appropriate, strange. The first was fools and wealth. The second is slaves that rule over princes. Now, at first, this is shocking to us in the first century, 20, not first century, 21st century. That is because of the slavery we think of. We think of the slavery that happened in the United States, that happened in the British Empire, that here where people were kidnapped from their homeland, enslaved, treated cruelly, beaten, they were seen as, as not a, they were seen as subhuman, not fully human. And that it was okay because they weren't like that. And that's the way man is, they justify things. That's what they did, they do that with, they did that with slavery, that they're not fully human. They did that with Jews. In the Holocaust, not fully human. They do that with babies in the womb. It's the same argument that from, from the time of slavery to the, to the Holocaust to now with abortion. Not human, where people aren't seen as made in the image of God. And it was wrong, it's sin. The Bible condemned that form of slavery. Exodus 21, 16, He who kidnaps a man... Whether he sells him or he's found in his possession shall surely put to death. God, God has made it very clear what he thought of American slavery. Those that did that was to be put to death. That was a death penalty, a capital offense. But slavery in ancient times, especially in Israel, was different. There were different types of slavery. And I, I can't go through all of them this morning. Maybe that would make go through the Sunday school time to go through what does the Bible actually say about slavery. But one of the forms of slavery is what we would call indentured servitude. When a person became poor enough, he would sell himself to pay a debt. And that was to be actually a last resort. Because God had set, set up several ways to help the poor. The people of Israel were not to glean the corners of the field nor take all the grapes in their vineyard. That was there for the poor and the widows that, so they can have food. That's how Ruth provided food for Naomi. So that's one of the ways God would help the poor. The poor could be helped by a kinsman redeemer when they had debts to be paid. When they were get to the point where they had to sell stuff, sell their land, for example, a kinsman redeemer could come and buy their land and give pay and re redeem it for them is what it was doing. Pay their debts. That's what happened with Boaz. Boaz did this for Ruth, and he married he married Ruth, but also redeemed Naomi's land, her husband's land. It had to be. It was going to be. Basically, it had to be sold off. And then interest was not to be charged to those who were poor. And then the year of Jubilee, all debts were forgiven. Plus, there's other ways. One of them was a person could rent out their land, and they would sell, in a sense, to a person by, it would be leasing it to be used, and a person would pay according to how many years were left according to the year of Jubilee, when all land would go back, when all debts were forgiven, when those who were indentured servitude would be even a time to be released. And so indentured servitude was a last resort. It wasn't the first thing somebody would think of doing. But if they wanted to do that, they could sell themselves so they could pay off debt. 
And it was only for six years. Deuteronomy 15, 12 through 16. If your kinsman, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you, then he shall serve you six years. But in the seventh year you shall set him free. When you have set him free, you shall not send him away empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine vat, and you shall give to him as the Lord your God has done what? Blessed you. You should remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore I command you this day, it shall come about, if he says to you, I will, know God, I will not go out from you, because he loves you and your household, since he fares well with you. And so, notice a couple things here. That it was for six years, it was limited. A person can stay if stay because they would say, say my needs are be taken care of uh, I love this I love my I love this who, he, this person is treating me well and so they can there was a time that they could they could choose to stay and be a permanent but notice that they didn't choose to be permanent they were to actually give them from their flocks give them food, they were to provide for them as they went out and started back on their feet. But if they wanted to stay, Exodus 21, 5 through 6 tells us, but if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go as a free man. Then his master shall bring him to God. Then he shall bring him to the door of the post, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him permanently. So there was this indentured servitude. And sometimes the wife may not go out as he did because one is his wife could have sold herself a little bit later down the road to be a servant. But there's other reasons as well. But this person wanted to stay. Another type of slavery in the Bible was that of a foreign nations. And I want to say another reason why slavery... There's many reasons why slavery in the Bible is different than American and British Empire and, and other forms of slavery go around the world is because, and especially American and British, is because it had nothing to do with race. See, with America, they saw, in the British Empire, they saw blacks from Africa as being subhuman. With slavery in the Bible, it had to do more with conquering nations is what it would do. That even what has happened with Israel and Egypt, where it wasn't because Pharaoh saw that they were subhuman, it was because Pharaoh saw that they were getting many people and did not want them to join with another nation and, and fight against them, forgetting what Joseph had actually done for them. And so, that, so the, another form of slavery would come about conquering people or making a treaty like that when the Gibeonites, Gibeonites who tricked Israel, who Jose, jo, jo, Joshua and Israel had said that you will be permanent slaves. You will cut wood and bring water to the, to the tabernacle and that you, that is what you will do. But Leviticus 25, Leviticus 25, 44 through 46 says, as your male and female slaves whom you may have, you may acquire male and female slaves from the pagan nations that are around you. Then too it is out of the sons of the sojourners who live as aliens among you that you may gain acquisition and out of their families who are with you, whom they will have produced in your land. They also may become your possessions. You may bequeath them to your sons after you to receive as a possession. You can use them as a permanent slave. They could, but they didn't have to. They could let them go. And there's many ways that a slave can go, go free, even a foreign slave. But the slavery is different. Look at Exodus 21, 26 through 27. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female slave and destroys it, he shall let him go free on account of his eye. And if he knocks out a tooth of his male or female sleeve, slave, he shall let him go free on account of his tooth. And even if a slave ran away as well, they were not to be returned. And so there was a lot of regulations and more than I have time to go into this morning that, uh, that God had placed in Israel. He allowed slavery from a time because of sin. 
peop, people are, we live in a sin-cursed world. And so we allow that for a time. It doesn't mean that the Bible promoted that and that as a, as a great thing. But God allowed that for a time. And so with this in mind about slavery and the kind of slavery they had, that it had nothing to do with, with, um, with somebody's race. It had nothing to do with any of those things. That, that we look back at verse, um, we look at verse 11, we, I mean verse 10. Luxury is not fitting for a fool, much less for a slave the rule over princes. And so, it may seem to us, when we read Ecclesiastes and Proverbs 19.10, that it may seem that Solomon thinks that princes, because of their royalty and what we would call royal blood and who they are, deserve their, their, deserve their status. And slaves, because of who they are, don't deserve any positions uh, of power, that they're worthy of, of, they're unworthy, I should say, of leadership. Well, part of what Solomon is concerned with is abilities and wisdom. Someone who is a slave is not likely to be equipped to deal with a sudden position of power. That person might not use the position wisely because they lack wisdom or could become a tyrant, especially if that person is a foolish person. All kinds of wickedness could be promoted. Yet at the same time, there have been many fools in history who have been ungodly leaders who have been, as we would say, royal blood, that have done a lot of evil. But when you look at all of Scripture, abilities and wisdom is what makes a person a good leader, not their social standing, their status, not just simply because they're born a prince to be king. Or this person is a lowly person on the, on, the, on the ladder there. It's wisdom and abilities. Because consider Joseph and Daniel who were both slaves and both were given leadership positions. Genesis 41, 38-40. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you of all of this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. So Joseph, who was a slave, does get a position of authority. Second command. And in some ways, he would be even had more power than Pharaoh himself, in a sense. Because he says, only in the throne I'll be greater than you. But no one is wise. And, and so he had a lot of authority, and he didn't abuse it. And neither did Daniel. Daniel was, in a sense, a slave because he was taken a, a captive. But Daniel showed himself wise and discerning. And so these both men were godly men who feared the Lord. And God rewarded them with high position of leadership, even in a foreign nation. And so the lesson from this is that wealth and power is not fitting for fools. Because we said that they will abuse their wealth, and they're going to abuse their power. They will use their wealth and power to promote sin and what God hates. I mean, I've seen in the workplace those who gain their leadership positions because of not what they know, not because of their abilities, but because of who they know. That maybe their brother was in a higher position of authority. Or they knew somebody. They were buddy-buddy with someone. You see this in government. People abusing their power, passing wicked laws. Much of what is going on is because there's a lot of fools in government. They will not turn to God. They refuse to look at the answer that's found in Christ and Him alone. Now this doesn't mean that a fool can never change, because a fool can. 
Because they do so by repenting and believing the gospel and turning to Jesus Christ. That's how a fool can change. And so this is why wealth, because fools will abuse those two things, wealth and power are only fitting for the wise. So use what God has given you for His glory to further His kingdom. They lay up treasures in heaven. Matthew 6, 19-21 Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we're to use what God has given us for His glory and honor. Store up treasures in heaven, not on this earth. Because what we love, what, where our heart is, that is what we're going to value. We're going to either value God's kingdom, the eternal, or we're going to value what is of this world. And then those who are in positions of authority at your work, use that for good. Don't abuse that power. Glorify God. And the reality is that every husband and father is a leader. Use that le- leadership to be a godly example not to push our weight around, but to be a servant leadership, to be a godly example, praying for our families, loving our families, teaching God's Word, making God's Word a priority, the service is a priority. And so we, so this is why leadership and wealth And all those things are fitting only for the wise because we will use them not perfectly, but our desire is to use them for God's glory and further His kingdom. And then second today, it is wise to be patient. It is not wise to have a short fuse. Proverbs 19.11, a man's discretion makes him slow to anger and in his glory to overlook a transgression. Not every single offense needs a response. Because that's how fools look at it. Everything, no matter how small, is big. Everything offends them is a serious problem. It may be something minor. But they will take it and twist it and make it something major. They're always wanting to argue. They're always wanting to fight. They're always wanting to cause problems. They are the person, for example, who goes on the Internet over a small problem and goes on a rant. It could be something as small as their order got messed up in the drive-thru. And instead of using their words and saying, hey, I got the wrong thing, like most people would do, even some unsaved people do, like, here, I got the wrong thing. Can you remake this? No, oh, no. They make it a federal case. You could actually accidentally bump into someone. And while most people understand when you say sorry or excuse me, I apologize, I didn't mean to do this, no, this person will cause you a scene. And I've seen that, it, that somebody else had bumped in another person, and oh, they, they, they're off the handle. And so because, because of that, of taking something minor, it becomes worse than it was. It creates more problems, more troubles, and it's like a dam that bursts. Proverbs seventeen fourteen: the beginning of strife is like letting out water, so abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. You know, it is like the Bible, there's a reason why the Bible uses a dam as an example. I think of the Jonestown flood. I've used this example before that happened in the 1800s. This dam should have been fixed and repaired. It was neglected. It had it, Some of the material that was used should have never been used when it made the dam even larger to make this lake for recreation. And so, because of that, being neglected, something small, that where a small leak could have been fixed, could have redone this dam like it should have been done, well, because of a f- rain, heavy rain, it just, it, d- that dam burst and it destroyed towns, killing people, 
Lots of people died. There was so much force that it took train, so much force in that water. There was trains taken off the tracks, slammed into bridges. And that's what anger is. That here, if you were to poke holes into a dam, that's what the beginning of strife is letting out. But then it becomes bigger and more problems. That's why the Bible says it's wise to be patient. And so that's not the way you and I are to be, is to be angry like them. We're to be patient and wise. Because when you're saved, you're different than the world. You're a new creature in Christ. You're the, you're the, have a, uh, you're a new, your identity is in Him. And so to be different means to be, as I've been saying, patient. Patient with both people and circumstances. Not quick to angry. Get angry. Consider how quick to get angry or how patient you are with other drivers on the road. Your co-workers, your neighbors, government officials, your spouse, your children, anyone. How patient or quick to get angry. Because you ought to be patient. Because when you're wise, you seek to avoid conflict. Be patient with your words. Proverbs 15.1 A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word does what? Stirs up anger. Proverbs 17.27 He who restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. So a person who is patient, who is gentle, and their answer turns away wrath. The person who restrains their words has knowledge. But an angry person is like a city that is broken into, and without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. I mean, a city back then, if it didn't have walls, if it didn't have a gate, the enemy can easily break in. Well, today, we don't have cities, we don't have, we don't have a wall that goes around the city of Gerard or Niles or any of these cities. But you do have doors and windows for your house. Could you imagine if the door was missing your house or the windows or part of your wall? Wouldn't offer much protection from the elements God's creatures or people. That is what an angry person is like, who has no control. The person is always a hothead. And so let's be patient. And to be patient also means to be forgiving. A man's discretion, look at that in verse 11 again, of 1911. A man's discretion makes him slow to anger and his glory to overlook a transgression. That means to be forgiving. To forgive. To overlook means to forgive. That I'm not going to make a big deal. I'm not going to, to make this into a big deal. I'm going to forgive. Now that way, that whether that is forgiving of something that of something does, somebody does to you that's not a sin, or it could be an it, or as well as to forgive sin when people confess that to you, to forgive them, rather than being an angry, bitter person, always thinking that they, they are doing this to get, get out, get, get at me, they, they, they hear, they just want something from me, or how dare they treat me like that, I deserve better than that. Because love Love is patient. Love is kind. As love forgives. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. Does not brag. Is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness. But rejoice with the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. And we have an example. This is actually speaks of what God's love is like. And this is a love that we can have as the Holy Spirit dwells in us. But consider, consider this, how God's Word tells you to deal with evil, evil people. To be, one is to be patient with them, 
But Romans 12, 18, 18 through 21, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is, enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, overcome e do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This would be doing, there are two, two types of forgiveness. First, there's the heart forgiveness. This is what this is talking about. When people do evil to us, and they never come to us and confess that, we still forgive them. God, we forgive them so I don't become bitter, so that I can do this, so that I can do good and, and heap burning coals on their head. I mean, not to, we're not trying to do, but God says that that will prick their conscience is what that's happening there. But we're going to feed them. We're going to do even an enemy. That's how the Bible tells us to treat an enemy. That here they do evil to us. We are forgiving. We forgive them. And we do good to them. But that doesn't mean that we are just... Um, naive, you know, that here thinking that all is well with that person. No, we know they're an enemy, but we forgive them and we're going to do good to them. And the second aspect of forgiveness is actually reconciliation. That comes from when somebody comes to you, confess their sin, and you reconcile the relationship. That there's no longer that here, that there's no longer that animosity to that here that they have towards you that here that or, or the fellowship is no longer broken with them but the reason that you can extend a reconciliation is because you first forgave them and you may be thinking to yourself you don't know what the person what these people have ever done to me but you're right i don't know but god does and God will take care of them. He says to leave room for his wrath. You do right and obey the Lord. Obey what he says right here. It, and it is hard. But it takes the Lord's help. And to be this kind of person, you need to consider what God has forgiven you of. Ephesians 4.32 Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Think about how much God has forgiven you of and what he has forgiven you of and how many times he has forgiven you over and over again. He's been patient with you. He is forgiving, loving God and merciful when you come to him and confess your sins. So consider what he has done. Then also consider how patient God is. God is our example. Exodus 34, 6, Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And Peter even talks about that God's patience towards people. I mean, that, he, that <clears throat> not willing that any perish, he speaks of. Give it. And so God is patient. If he was not a patient God, he would destroy this earth many times over. Because it does deserve that. But also consider Christ's patience throughout his ministry. I mean, the Pharisees, what they did to him, and what they said about him, and lied about him, his pa he was extremely patient. He spoke the truth in love. He was firm with them. Angry, not in the anger that we have, but here they, are, here they are twisting the scriptures and blinding people. And then think about the patience when he, was cro when he was on the cross, when he was mocked. He was mocked by the Roman rulers, he's mocked by the priest, and the, he was mocked by the soldiers, he's mocked, mo mocked by the Pharisees, he's mocked by the passing by, he's mocked by as well as the thieves on the cross. He was extremely patient. 
If he had our patience, he would have came off the cross and called down 10,000 angels. But he was extremely patient. And so, let us ask ourselves, are we patient? How patient are we? And if we're honest, we're not perfectly patient. And we're probably not where, as patient as we want to be. But we should ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Help us put off the ways of the old man and put on the new man. Ephesians 4, 22-24, That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. That here that we are a new creature, a new creation in Christ. And so, being angry and impatient is part of the old self. That's part of the old man that when we were under Adam in our sins and trespasses, that here that we still have, we're not in Adam anymore, as, but we're in Christ, but there still is the flesh, that it, it tempts us, that we think that I don't deserve this, I don't deserve to be treated like this, that this person should not speak to me like this. How dare they treat me like that? But we need to be patient. We need to be forgiving and loving because that is the way of wisdom. And as well as use our resources and what God has given to us for His honor and glory.